Good morning. Section 2 of Chapter 5 deals with the events that occurred after the colonies, or excuse me, the new states of the United States had decided the Articles of Confederation just weren't working. Um, foreign governments didn't know who to negotiate with, whether it be the central government or the states. Not only that, you know, there were problems with taxation, and there'll be some other issues that spring up as well. The most important of all these is Shays' Rebellion. 1786 to 1787, armed farmers demand closing of courts to avoid losing farms. Well, eventually the state militia would have from Massachusetts would have to defeat Daniel Shays. However, this caused a widespread issue because other governors had refused to send troops. And many leaders feared that rebellion would soon spread through the country. So George Washington, from his home in Mount Vernon, called for a stronger national government. Here's some pictures of the of Shays' Rebellion. To make a long story even longer, it was mainly fought over um, military veterans, number one, wanting a pension. And number two, it was fought over the fact that Many of the banks were seizing the farms of farmers who had fought in the revolution uh, because they couldn't pay their mortgage payments. So they decided to call for a convention. Five states had already sent delegates to a meeting on interstate trade in 1786. Later on, 12 states would join this, what would later become known as the Constitutional Convention. James Madison of Virginia is known as the father of the Constitution. In 1787, 55 delegates from 12 colonies, or I keep saying colonies, y'all forgive me. Um, but anyway, uh, 55 delegates from 12 states met at the Pennsylvania State House. Rhode Island did not send a delegate. This was so secretive that they kept the windows shut to prevent eavesdropping. Washington at first was unanimously chosen as the presiding officer of this convention. There's a picture on the left of James and Madison on the right of George Washington. Now, it's important to understand what these gentlemen are doing is basically planning to overthrow the existing government and create a new government. Now, this is not going to be a military overthrow, but a political overthrow. One of the first issues that arose when trying to write this new constitution was the argument between big states versus small states. The delegates recognized the need to strengthen the central government and decide to form a new government. Madison had written the Virginia Plan, which called for a bicameral legislature based on population, so both houses in the legislature, or Congress, would be based upon population. Well, the smaller states were like, no way, that's going to happen. Uh, William Patterson's New Jersey Plan called for a single house, with each state getting one vote. The problem with that was it wasn't much different than the Articles of Confederation. However, Roger Sherman, the delegate from Connecticut, proposed the Great Compromise, also known as the Connecticut Compromise. He created an idea of a bicameral legislature, a Senate, which was based upon equal representation, and early on elected by state legislatures and not the people, a House of Representatives based on population and elected by the people. Here's a pretty good uh, Venn diagram of the Virginia plan and the New Jersey plan. Now, this set of lecture notes can be found at my website, coachvice.com. As you can see, the Virginia plan called for a bicameral legislature, but both based on population. The New Jersey plan called for a unicameral legislature in which every state received one vote. Both plans call for a strong national government with three branches. The Great Compromise provided for a bicameral Congress where the state representation was based upon population in the House of Representatives and on um, each state having an equal number of votes in the Senate. Both houses of Congress must pass every law. There were other conflicts and compromises that needed to be worked out. 
First, the South wanted slaves in the population to count for the house, but not for taxes. The North wanted slaves in the population to count for taxes, but not for the house. Now, this is tricky, and it's been grossly misunderstood in today's history. The South wanted slaves to count as one full person, while the North said they shouldn't be counted at all when determining how big a state is. Why this? Because the North did not want to perpetuate slavery. The three-fifths compromise was agreed upon, which allowed three-fifths of the state slaves to be counted. Now, sometimes you see commercials and other uh, media which say that, oh, during this time period, they thought that an African-American was only worth three-fifths of a person. That's not accurate. This had nothing to do with what a person was worth or not worth. This was simply whether or not they should be used in tallying population in the census for the House of Representatives. Congress was given much more power to regulate foreign, foreign trade and could not interfere with the slave trade for 20 years. Here's a pretty good diagram of the three-fifths compromise and how it would work. If you notice the box on the top, those are white people. Each one counts it completely. And on the bottom, you have, if there are five black people, you only count three of them in the census, which would determine the number of people in the house. Creating a new government, division of powers. A new concept comes along called federalism. It wasn't completely new, but as far as in a governmental system, and it called for a division of power between the national and the state governments. National government has delegated or enumerated powers. We had a little glitch in the system. We'll try to get this up and running pretty quick. We were I mean, discussing a moment ago that the national government had delegated or enumerated powers. And what that means, the actual word enumerated means numbered. And that explains these are specifically mentioned in the Constitution as part of the powers of the national government. Uh, in this top government, the nation will handle the foreign affairs, defense, interstate trade and money. But... There were also powers kept by the states, and these are called reserved powers. The states would handle education, marriage laws, trade within the state. Now, some of these have been kind of put in the venue of the federal government lately, and that's controversial to a lot of people. Shared powers include the right to tax, borrow money, and establish courts. Both the federal and state governments can tax their people, borrow money, They're usually through the selling of bonds and other issues, and to establish a court system. If you look at this Venn diagram, it gives you a better idea of what these powers are. You might want to take a, a moment and pause the video if you like and look at this, or actually copy the diagram. So as they began to create this new constitution, the first thing they did, as we talked about, they tried to uh, outline the difference between the federal and state governments but then also to create a separation of powers. Much of this came come from the ideas set forth by Rousseau and Montesquieu. And in, under separation of powers, you have a legislative branch of government, which makes the laws, an executive branch, which carries out the laws, a judicial branch, which interprets the laws. Now, bear in mind, let's, before we go any further, a legislative means to legislate, legis, to make law. So that's what Congress is supposed to do. The executive branch, root word execute or exact, which means to carry out or to enforce is another term that we use in civics a lot. And the judicial branch, even though the textbook predominantly talks about interpreting the laws, this came about with Marbury versus Madison, which we'll talk about later. But the judicial branch itself also sets up the court system to settle disputes and things of that nature as well. Now, what this does, it creates a system of checks and balances where one branch is not a lot more powerful than the other ones. Now, the Constitution itself was set up where the legislative branch does have more power than the other two, or it's supposed to be, because it more directly represents the people. Sometimes we forget that when we think about how powerful the president is or the courts. But the legislative branch, in the case of the federal government, is Congress. In the case of our state government, it would be the state legislature. They actually have more power 
than the other two branches, or they're supposed to anyway. And as we talked about earlier, when we talked about the difference between a democracy and a republic, it's important to note that the uh, electoral college was created to keep the uneducated in check. I guess is the best way you could put that. They didn't feel that ab the average person had the ability to choose leaders directly. So they created the, legis the electoral college, which has undergone a lot of changes through the years, but it's still present. <clears throat> However, the constitution itself is not static. It doesn't stay the same. It can be amended predominantly through the amendment process, but it can also be amended unofficially through change in, in interpretation. And that in itself is also controversial. This is a, something I found on the internet. I couldn't even find the source. Uh, I just got it off an image search. I thought it was so, uh, such a good uh, image. So forgive, forgive me if you're the person that created this, you didn't credit yourself, but, um, a bad idea, all the powers of government in one place, and a better idea, legislative, executive, and judicial branches that share power. Here's another image from the textbook. We talked in class about what actually governs the country. The key is the Constitution. The Constitution de designates that it is the supreme law of the land, and all other laws have to fall within the jurisdiction of constitutional law. And that leads us with section three, ratifying the constitution, which will be our next series. If you have any questions, please feel free to email me.